Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So today we are going to talk about um, the algorithmic aspects of topological data analysis. Uh, and we are going to focus on the problem of uh, topology inference. So the problem is very simple. You are given an unknown uh, topological space, shaped like a bean here. And uh, you only know a point sample that's dense enough, but usually noisy, usually embedded in a high dimensional space. And the question is, how can I infer some, say, topological property of the original uh, topological space? Um, and as we will see, we will use the theory of persistent homology that has been mentioned quite a few times already today. Um, so we see that the construction, actually, uh, the full pipeline for inferring homology has several steps of different nature. Uh, so you first start with some geometry because you're given a point cloud, uh, but then you will do a bit of combinatorics and finally a bit of algebra. Um, today we will focus on geometry. The topic is actually uh, quite wide. You have many ways to improve uh, the complexity of algorithm to uh, make things faster and more compact. Uh, and today we'll see the geometric aspects of these. And mostly they are very important because uh, the geometry and the size of structures is usually one of the big bottlenecks uh, when we are doing topological data analysis. Um, so I will present uh, today three uh, constructions, uh, three of the main constructions that have been proposed to uh, improve uh, the solutions for topological data analysis and topology inference. All right, so let's start with standard persistent homology. So as I said, we have a topological space given only by a point sample. So if you want to infer properties, if you want to understand the shape of the original topological space, a good strategy is to grow a set of balls on each of the points of your sample. So you get this way with considering the union of balls, the green domain here on the screen, you get an increasing domain that is a rough, thick, approximation of your underlying topological space. Uh, and as you can see, at some point uh, here, we managed to get a fairly good uh, approximation, except thicker. Because we are uh, seeking to do algorithms, uh, instead of considering union, union of balls, which are continuous domains, we are going to consider uh, simpler complexes, which are discrete approximations of this uh, union of balls that actually have the same topology the same homotopy type. So we get a sequence of uh, these piecewise linear approximation, piecewise linear domain, included in each other. And we are going to extract uh, shape features. Uh, so for the topologists in the room, uh, these are uh, homology features. So the H here stands for uh, homology. And I've actually circled the information the homology groups capture, which are uh, the circles here, the, the holes, if you want. So here you have um, four holes, here you have two, here you have only one, and here you have none. Um, and as you can see, uh, because the point is noisy, you have often small holes, which are not meaningful topological features, because they do not exist in the underlying domain. And you have the red hole, the big hole, which is meaningful, because it exists in the original unknown topological space. So to extract this information, to make the difference between noise and um, uh, meaningful signal, we track uh, the survival of um, holes, of the topological features, when we change the scale. And we get this barcode, uh, which intuitively corresponds to, if you consider the red bar, the creation of the red feature here, its survival, and then the time we actually fill it up because we are considering balls that are too big. And as you can see, the small topological noise corresponds to small bars and can be uh, removed, can be not considered, and the actual signal that describes the actual topology of the underlying shape corresponds to long bars. And then this barcode uh, gives us the information we are seeking, which is, say, the number of holes in the unknown topological space. So this is the classic persistent homology uh, pipeline. And as you can see on the top right corner of this slide, uh, this has attracted a lot of work. Uh, I've cited a few names that have uh, introduced the theory of persistent homology and also uh, people who have worked on uh, showing that 
doing this kind of construction with the union of balls actually gives you uh, a probably correct barcode, meaning that the long bars do indeed correspond to meaningful topological features of the unknown space. So let's, uh, let's see why this construction works, okay? Um, so here we have uh, our uh, point cloud and the union of balls at a good radius. If you look closely, actually what happens is that uh, you can shrink the union of balls toward the underlying domain. It's unknown, but mathematically you can uh, build what's called a deformation retract and actually prove that uh, your union of ball uh, retracts to the unknown domain. And for a good radius, and if your set of points is dense enough, then you will always be able to do that. Uh, and then that's how you capture the topology. Um, and when you extract the diagram, when you change the scale, what happens is, at the beginning, you have a transition phase uh, where essentially you're waiting for the balls to connect and eventually draw a good enough shape. But then because you have this deformation retract for a certain uh, interval of scales, then you get a very clean barcode where you, the bars here do indeed correspond to uh, the holes in your underlying domain. So you get a very clean signal with a little bit of noise at the beginning maybe a little bit of noise at the end when you start filling up things, and a very clear signal in the middle. The biggest problem with this construction is that computing union of balls in high dimensional spaces is a very uh, hard problem. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so first let me say that because we are doing computations, um, we are not considering the domain spanned by the union of balls, but instead a piecewise linear representation of it which is called the Chech complex. And uh, the Chech complex is defined on the following fashion. Uh, so it's a set of vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedra, and so on, uh, defined in the following way. Uh, you have a vertex for uh, every ball. You put a vertex at the center of every ball. Uh, if two balls intersect, uh, then you draw an edge between the two vertices. If three balls have a common intersection, then you put the triangles, and so on, for four ways intersection, and so on. And uh, the nerve uh, lemma in, um, uh, in topology tells you that the domain span by your piecewise linear approximation has the same homotopy type, the same topology as uh, the union of balls. So you can work with a piecewise linear uh, approximation, and because it's a discrete structure, you can represent it and work with it. And because at every scale you get a Chech complex that has the exact same topology, then you get the exact same barcode. Very good. So, as I said, union of balls are hard to compute, which means this Chech complex is hard to compute. So, uh, to have a durable uh, representation, we do a bit of a we do a relaxation of these uh, conditions. So we keep the same vertices and the same edges uh, because these are easy to compute. You just the, the intersection of two balls is just a distance measure between the two centers of the balls. So this is something we can compute efficiently. Uh, and considering this, um, if we have, uh, we consider the maximal uh, structure we can put with such a set of edges. Meaning that as long as I have three edges, I will put a triangle in it. Uh, if I have four edges, uh, I will put a tetrahedron and so on. So that's how you see that this empty triangle here that did not appear because the three balls were pairwise intersecting but not, uh, did, not, did not have a common intersection, the three of them, uh, made a hole. But here, because we have the three edges, we just plug a triangle. And so this is a close, uh, this is a structure that is closed, slightly bigger than the Chet complex. It's called the, the Ritz complex. And it requires only distance computation. And obviously, by definition, uh, if C stands for the church and R stands for the Ribs complex, for a given radius R, you get the following inclusion. The church complex is included in uh, the Ribs complex. But then if you increase the scale of the church complex, eventually your Ribs will be included and you can have like a sequence of inclusion between church, Ribs, church, Ribs, and so on with uh, a multiplicative factor, uh, theta, for the radius. And because you have this interleaving, Intuitively, your persistence barcode will be similar. And that's something you can prove. That's exactly what happens. Um, 
you're going to get a similar barcode. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, the two barcodes differ only by a set that could be big, but a set of short bars. So eventually what you get is a, a noisier barcode, but you can still make the difference between the signal and the noise because the only thing you add are short bars. And short bars correspond to noise. So in the following uh, uh, of the talk, I will um, talk about union of balls and everything, but keep in mind that when we do computations, we don't consider the chest complex, but we consider the ribs complex, which, is, which gives you a signal that is close. All right? So this is the theory of persistence in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Uh, and everything works, and under a sufficiently dense uh, point samples, you can prove that you get uh, a good barcode. So algorith algorithmically, what happens? You have domains that are sequential complexes that are included in each other. So the elementary update you do is a simplex insertion. So on the right here, suppose you have a domain and you insert uh, a new triangle. You want to track what happens uh, at the topological uh, level. And actually, the update is very simple. Uh, you have two possibilities uh, when you add one uh, simplex. Either you are closing uh, a sphere, like in this example, and you are creating a void within the sphere, the, the sphere which is a non-trivial topological feature. So you are creating topology, if you want. And the second option is, uh, you have this uh, sheet here, and uh, you are plugging a triangle, and you are filling in a hole. So you are destroying some topological feature here. Either you create one topological feature, or you destroy one. Very simple. So on a more interesting example, at the bottom, you have a domain here, and I will add pieces. So here we start with one hole, which is represented by this homology class. And that's the beginning of a bar in your barcode. All right, I'm adding a new edge here, so I have the inclusion, and I'm creating a new hole that's represented by this cycle here. Third hole, third feature, and so at the moment we have three bars alive. And now I'm putting a cap on top of uh, the outer circle, all right? And this actually destroys a hole. Um, and so you need to, when you compute persistent homology, you need to decide which bar you are going to kill, which bar you are going to destroy. And the way you do that is actually by doing a simple linear algebra. So without going into the details, uh, this map will induce um, a map at the homological level and this map has a kernel that is equal to the sum of the three elements representing bars in your barcode. And that means that you are going to have to kill one, and usually, and what's correct is to kill the one that has appeared the most recently, which is the one at the top here. And the way to do it is uh, to do a linear combination of this one with, this two, uh, with these two features, and then get the kernel appear here, and because this element is cancelled out by this map, that means that the bar is actually stopped when you pass the map. So this is the hand-wavy explanation of what's going on in uh, persistence. But in terms of linear algebra, it's exactly what happens if you formalize things a little bit. So the thing I want you to take away from that is that the update at the homological level, the update you do in your topology is very small. Either you create a hole or you destroy one, which means that in your persistence diagram, only one bar will be modified. OK, so if we go back to uh, this slide, um, we see that at the end of the construction, here on the right side, we have absolutely gigantic uh, structures. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge bottleneck in uh, the computation. So that's something we, are trying, we will try to address with the second geometric construction I will present which is a, a specified version of persistence. So this is a zoomed, out, uh, zoomed in versions of what happens locally when you do your union of balls. And as you can see, if you isolate one, uh, one of these balls, it's not really useful for the full construction. It doesn't participate much because everything is covered by the surrounding balls, all right? So something you can do is uh, you can remove it. Or instead of removing it, we are actually going to merge this point with a neighbor point. Okay? 
So we are merging this, the ball disappeared, and you get this domain, which is topologically equivalent. Um, so you can formalize actually this construction um, doing the following. So I'm giving you a set of points, uh, a radius that approximate the underlying shape, which is uh, some uh, ellipsoid here. And I pick a subset of points. That's an epsilon net uh, that is uh, well spread. This is a good sample of uh, the original set of points P. Um, <clears throat> and I'm considering, considering the nearest neighbor of every red point that I have selected, and I will merge them to this point. Okay? So you can see in orange, it's a Voronoi cell. And I'm merging every point that has not been selected within a Voronoi cell to the Voronoi center, which is the red point here. Um, <clears throat> this way, I get a construction, I get a way to uh, reduce my point cloud to a smaller point cloud, the red one here, and if I increase the radius, uh, I get again a domain that has the right topology, which is again this uh, underlying ellipsoid, except I have less points. Okay? So if you fix the right values for epsilon, if you change the scales, uh, if you increase the scale in an appropriate fashion, you actually define, you have a well-defined map between the corresponding ribs complex uh, corresponding to this union of balls. It's not an inclusion anymore because the set of points differ, uh, but it's a well-defined map at the combinatorial level. And then I can keep going. Uh, I can take a subsample of the subsample, so this way I get an epsilon square net, and keep going until I have no points left anymore. And so this way, I have a sequence of uh, specified domain, again, and I can do persistence on that. So this construction was... Uh, the, the idea of specification was uh, first introduced by Dunshi in uh, 2012. And then this construction uh, came a bit later uh, with uh, people from Ohio State University in 2014. And actually, uh, this kind of construction that allow you to deal with much smaller structures I've had a fair bit of success, and you have uh, different uh, contributions uh, in the field uh, in this. So if we look at the algorithm now, uh, when I go from uh, the left union of balls to the right one, what happens? Well, first I increase the scale. So when you increase the scale, you're expecting to get more simplices. All right? So you are going to have uh, inclusions. So you are going to, like in normal persistence, like in standard persistence, you are going to add more simplices and get inclusions. So that's something we know how to do. This is the standard persistence case. The thing is, when you merge points, uh, when you get one of the points that has not been selected and you merge it with one of the red points, you also do edge contractions, uh, which is a new type of update. And uh, edge contractions are actually trickier to deal with. So as you can see here, I'm merging the orange point with the red point, and they are sharing one edge, say. When you do the edge contraction, you are dragging everything uh, with the contraction, and you get this simplicial complex. So if, you, if you're looking at this edge, after the contraction, it becomes this edge, and so on. And as you can see from these pictures, uh, you can count uh, five holes in this domain, and by doing only one contraction, you have only two holes left. So you have a much more complex change in the topology when you do contractions. Uh, here you are losing three holes. So technically, in your barcode, you are killing three intervals. So in terms of algorithm, you are going to have to deal with these kind of things. So you, are, uh, you have this more uh, advanced kind of updates, uh, which is a challenge algorithmically. Fortunately, because we are in a geometric context, uh, the number of uh, holes you are destroying locally will strongly depend on the geometry uh, of your domain. And usually you have uh, a nice set of points sampling, say, a manifold of a small dimension. So you may have many holes you destroyed, but it's bounded by something depending on the local dimension and the quality of your sample. So let's say you have a a medium number of bars to, uh, to take care of. So that's the kind of updates you're going to have to deal with when you do this pacification. The, the advantage of it is that because you are selecting subsamples, you are dealing with much smaller simple complexes. And then you are addressing the memory bottleneck 
at the cost of slightly more complex updates. So this is for uh, specification. Um, so going back to uh, the picture of specification, we've seen that uh, in order to remove one ball, we've actually merged it to a neighbor point. But that's not exactly what we, what we would like to do. We would like to remove the balls, and that would be a more natural thing to do. Uh, just simply remove the ball, remove the point. And that's what we are going to do with zigzag persistence. So this is another generalization of uh, persistent homology. So this is a standard persistence pipeline I've presented earlier. And in green here, you have uh, the scale, the, the size of the balls we are considering. And as you can see, it's a very monotonous thing. You have a fixed set of points, you increase the radius, and you get this growing sequence. But as you can see uh, here, when we have many points, it doesn't make sense to consider big radii because we are just killing everything. We are recovering everything. So it's a, a smarter thing to do would be to adapt the size, the scale, the, the size of the balls to the sample. So here the construction I'm presenting, as you can see, I'm considering uh, fewer points than uh, in, the, in the normal persistence case. I'm, having, I'm subsampling my set of points. I'm starting with very few points and a big scale. Then I'm adding more points, so I get a bigger complex. But then I'm reducing the scale because having more points allows me to consider smaller scales in order to connect everything together. And I keep going. Uh, add more points, reduce the scale, and so on. The only difference here, all maps are inclusions, but now they go in both ways, hence the name zigzag persistence. So if you read this construction from right to left, we are actually exactly doing the, the ball suppression uh, I, would, I was wishing to do for specification. Because if you consider here, I have a big set of points and a small scale. When I go here, I'm considering a subset of the points, and I'm adapting the scale. I'm just getting a bigger scale. But here, I'm removing the points explicitly, because now I'm going, my arrows go in both ways, so I can add and remove things. Um, and if I go from here to here, I'm doing the, this thing again, taking a subsample of the points and considering a bigger scale. So this way, I'm also keeping much smaller structures except that instead of merging points together, which is a complex update, I'm uh, removing things. And from there, I can again extract topological features and uh, extract a persistent barcode. The very good property of zigzag persistence is that uh, you can prove that it gives a very, very clean barcode, uh, where, as you can see, the signal appears very clearly from the noise, and the noise is actually ephemeral. So the noise will exist only within one index, appears and gets destroyed instantly. So you get a very clear signal, topological signal, when you do zigzag persistence while keeping small structures. So what's the cost to pay? Um, well, the cost to pay is uh, the algorithmic cost, because now adding and removing simplices will be more difficult at the algorithmic level. So if I'm giving you a sequence of complexes like this, where every arrow is either, either forward or backward, meaning I'm inserting or I'm removing a simplex, we found out that the best way to compute that, the most efficient way to compute uh, zigzag persistence, is to do updates not at the end of the sequence, but in the middle. So here I'm maintaining a prefix that is identical to a prefix of the original sequence I'm computing. And I'm doing updates in the middle. So we will focus on the arrow reflection, where I'm, as an update, I'm adding one simplex and removing it instantly. So doing this kind of updates and also exchanging the order of insertion of two uh, simplices, we are able to compute zigzag persistence under these kind of updates. So now what happens in the persistence barcode when we do such thing? Well, here is an example. Uh, so as you can see, it looks like the example I've taken earlier, except now it's zigzagging. So the left arrows are forward, the right arrow are backward. 
And again, I'm creating holes in a given order. Uh, if I go to the bottom sequence, I'm doing nothing. And then I'm destroying holes in another order. And the top sequence here is adding an extra simplex and removing it instantly. So this corresponds to um, the arrow reflection I've uh, described earlier. So if you look at the bottom sequence, th things go as expected. Uh, Every bar corresponds to the survival of the hole you wish the bar corresponds to. Uh, so if you take the top left hole here, it exists since index 1. Then it survives along the sequence, untouched, and then get destroyed here when we remove the piece that constructs uh, the hole. And as you can see, the bar corresponds exactly to the appearance here at index 1. And then the di disappearance right before we remove the corresponding arc circle. And then it's the same for the two other bars. And then you get your barcode quite naturally. But now I'm actually shuffling things together when I'm adding the cap on top. Because, well, here I'm destroying a hole. This is a subjective map at the homological level. And so technically you should have a bar disappearing right before this map here because it's subjective and it's killing something. And on the right side you should have also a bar uh, starting because following this arrow is also destroying something. So, and in order to have this, if you want to take a representative for this bar, to, like if you want an actual uh, homology element to which it corresponds, you need to put the kernel of the application. That's the way uh, you get it to disappear when you follow the arrow. And the kernel of this application is, as earlier, it's the outer circle, because you're putting, you're putting the cap on it. And it's just the linear sum of these three elements. OK? But now, now I have a different element here. Um, so what happens to the other bars of the barcode? And so you get the following, which is actually a non-trivial transformation. So if you look on the right side here, you have this hole. That's, I mean, that's honest because that's the only hole that exists here. And the way this, uh, this hole survives is the following. So it remains untouched here. And when you go to the middle phase where you are uh, mixing things together because of the addition of the new cap, you are actually adding the kernel to this element. And you get this one because we are working with Z2 coefficients. And that's the way this element actually survives, is by being mixed up with the kernel. And that's how, actually, the endpoint of this bar is actually different now. It ends at index 2, when it used to, if you follow this hole here, end at index 3. And that's actually the operation that uh, things get uh, shuffled uh, when you do this kind of operation. And we understand we have a... Uh, they get shuffled in a controlled way. But the thing to remember is that many bars get uh, mixed together. And in the case of edge contractions, we had only a limited number of bars because they depend on the geometry. Here the problem is that they depend on the algebra and the topology of the object. So technically, if your uh, homology basis gets complicated, you could have an arbitrary number of bars getting changed by these kind of updates. And this is going to cost more, obviously. Um, so I guess it's time to conclude uh, and see what these three constructions do. So this is a, a practical example, just a toy example. This is a set of points on a torus. And the torus is embedded in a three sphere, sort of wrapped around a three sphere. So when you look at small scales and do uh, persistence inference, you are going to see a torus. And, uh, that's something you see very clearly here. Um, so you see one connected component correspond to one, this uh, point. The two triangles correspond to the two non-contractible contractible loops on the torus. And they appear very clearly far away from the diagonal here. And the brown circle correspond to the void inside the torus. So here you get a very clear persistence diagram when you do standard persistent homology. Except that for getting this, I've constructed uh, a simple complex of hundreds of millions of simplices. And that took me almost an, an hour. Uh, and I see no uh, three sphere here. 
So my torus is wrapped around the three sphere, so I get a poor sample of the three sphere, but you could hope to get something, but you don't in the case of standard persistence. And mathematically, we've estimated how many simplices we would need to see uh, the sphere appear, like a three-dimensional void inside, and we would need 40 billion simplices. So this is something that's completely out of uh, reach. So if you do sparse persistence, because you are approximating things up, you get um, a noisier diagram from which you can still extra extract the torus quite well. You can see one connected component here. The two triangles correspond to uh, the two non-contractical loops. And you see that, yeah, you, you get the void also of the torus, except you get a bit more noise near or almost near the diagonal. So this is still something readable, but noisier. Except that here we are maintaining much, much smaller simpler complexes, and this goes much faster, of course. But we still don't see the sphere. So let's go to zigzag persistence. In zigzag persistence, we also get the torus very clearly. So here, these are two superimposed triangles, but we also see the sphere appear because we get a cleaner diagram and we don't get noise. So this, is, this looks close to the diagonal, the sub-dimensional features, but that's the only one we have. So it's actually a meaningful feature. But as you can see here, we get in between in terms of performance. We need uh, a few millions of dates. The simple complexes we maintain are actually very small still, and we need a few hundred seconds. So this is in between a term of performance, but we get a better diagram. So all these methods are actually complete each other, depending on the kind of samples you have. So finally, to conclude, um, you see that just Around solving this inference problem, we've uh, introduced technology, like new ways to compute geometric filtration, how to maintain smaller structures, and everything was motivated by performance somehow. And um, the history of um, persistent homology has actually <coughs> bring us all this kind of, uh, um, all of this kind of uh, performance and new tools. Um, and actually, this has, uh, started a, a renew, uh, renewal of interest in mathematics, for example, uh, where new problem, new algebra problems has come from uh, these uh, new tools. And I would like to conclude with like a perspective. If I give you uh, a new kind of data, so this is just CT scan, so this is uh, an image that uh, changes with time, okay? So this is uh, a brain and a skull, obviously. And you would like to track the evolution of, say, the shape of some features in this. How could you do that, considering the tools we have? The problem with the inclusion-based standard persistence is that going from one picture to, to the other, you would need some kind of embedding, some kind of inclusion. But these pictures are not related. They correspond to different slices. Uh, so that's something you cannot do in an easy fashion. When you have inclusion and contraction, you can actually do better kind, more advanced kind of uh, matching between two data that is uncorrelated. So you will need some kind of deformation from one data to the other, or some kind of morphing between pictures. So that's something that would be expensive to compute, but that's doable. And finally, if you can do zigzag persistence, well, you have a very easy way to do that with inclusions. You start with the first picture, you include it in the union of the two. So think about just superimposing the two pictures, for example. And then you have the inclusion going in the other way, and then you can build your zigzag sequence. So these tools that were meant for topological inference at the beginning are actually giving us new ways to study more complex data in, uh, in more advanced fashion. So I'm looking forward to people using these kind of tools to new kinds of data, because I think we have the technology these days. So that's uh, my conclusion. Thank you very much.